All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, in partnership with Bookends and Beginnings and the Evanston Public Library, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Archie Bunjabani and Tristan Jimerson to discuss their book, A Quick and Easy Guide to They Them Pronouns. My name is Pim Halka, and I am the Exhibits and Creative Programming Library Assistant at the Evanston Public Library. I use Zizir, he, him, or they, them pronouns. For the purposes of tonight, feel free to use they, them pronouns for me. My colleague, Heather Ross, will be our tech host and she will be moderating the chat. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly go over the structure for this evening. We will begin with a land acknowledgement and community norms as we share this virtual brave space together. We will then pass it off to Archie and Tristan who will speak a bit about their book. We'll then have a Q&A session. And as you have questions throughout the night, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll discuss them near the end. And then we'll close out the evening um, discussing some future events coming up. So we would like to acknowledge and honor the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe tribes, also known as the Council of Three Fires, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations who lived and live on this land. We would now like to take a moment to build community agreements together. This is a space of learning, healing, and growth. Learning and questions are expected. However, we won't tolerate bigotry, racism, homophobia, sexism, or transphobia in this space. If this arises, individuals will be muted and exited from the space. Please respect other people's privacy. Lessons learned should leave this space, but the details of what's shared should stay here. And now a bit about our authors. Archie Bunjavani is a cartoonist and illustrator living in Minneapolis. Their graphic novel, A Quick and Easy Guide to They Them Pronouns was published in 2018. Their comic, Grease Bats, is published monthly on Autostraddle and has been collected as a graphic novel by Boom Studios. Bunjavani's work has been featured in The New Yorker, The Nib Magazine, Vice, and Electric Literature. Bunjavani is currently working on their next original graphic novel, Mimosa, published by Shirley Press, and, the author is, um, and is the author of the forthcoming history comics, Stonewall. Tristan Jimerson is a freelance copywriter living in Minneapolis. His award-winning work has been featured in publications such as Creativity Magazine and The Egoist. He has written copy for everything from exercise equipment to electronics. In fact, if you've been inside a Best Buy within the last six months, you've probably read something he wrote. Tristan grew up on the rolling plains of rural Iowa and after deciding that wasn't cold enough, moved to Minnesota. Without further ado, Archie and Tristan. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Thanks Thank so much for having you. us. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to try not to talk over each other. Um, so give me one second to do that so we have some nice visuals while um, we chat. All righty. Just double checking, everyone can see that okay. Tristan, you're the only one I can hear, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, okay. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, thanks so much for coming um, to this chat. Tristan and I published this book in 2018. Um, and we, when we were kind of like chatting about this presentation, this talk, we realized that we hadn't, um, talked about this book since its publication together. Like we've hung out and talked about lots of things, but um, we haven't really had like a presentation or a chat with the two of us in like a group setting since I think our opening event or our publication event. Yeah, I think it was the launch party. Yeah, since, yeah, the, yeah, since it um, came out. So. I don't know, I think it's kind of exciting that we're able to kind of like reflect years after um, it's been out. Um, and I think I'm gonna start with just a little bit about who I am. 
my name's Archie. I use they, them pronouns. As mentioned in the bio, Minneapolis, I make comics and I make a lot of zines as well. Um, but today we're strictly gonna um, focus on a quick and easy guide to they, them pronouns. Um, and I'm gonna talk a teeny bit about my own non-binary journey. Um, often I talk, when I, when I do talk about this book to folks, um, it's usually to a pretty mixed crowd as far as folks who use they, them pronouns and are like fans of the book or have used the book to sixth graders who it's like a totally new concept or, or like a vague kind of idea to um, like coworkers or parents who are brand new to um, non-binary identities and they, them pronouns. So I always like to kind of like talk about what it was like for me um, I came out as genderqueer a number of years ago. I don't like doing math, so I'm not going to tell you how long ago it was. Um, genderqueer is under the non-binary umbrella, um, and I couldn't really, like, figure out exactly how I felt at the time. Um, I just knew that something was, like, not lining up. Something wasn't, like, clicking with how I viewed myself and my gender. Um, and when I came across the term genderqueer and the term non-binary, it really kind of like hit me like a ton of bricks that here's a term that, um, that could like really click with how perhaps I was feeling at the time. Um, it kind of felt before I came out as non-binary, kind of felt like my gender was like a puzzle piece. I was like trying to jam into the wrong spot is that if you kind of like know that kind of feeling. Um, and as soon as I came out as non-binary, it felt very solidifying um, for me. And that is only like me and my own personal kind of like journey. Now we're gonna talk about who is Tristan Jimerson. <laughs> I drew this illustration of Tristan years ago. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name's Tristan. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I am cis. I am straight majority of the time. And um, yeah, I'm friends with Archie. We actually met before I was doing any writing and was still cooking all the time um, in the service industry where, and I'm sure all of you know, in the library world, in the retail world, in the service industry world, you are exposed to a lot of people. You're meeting people constantly. People are gendering you based on how you look. And during Archie's kind of coming out, I try to be an ally in that situation, um, which was very difficult to kind of help them through that when you, with customers. And so this originally started as a small zine, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but Archie and I have been working together on projects from before this for probably about a, what, a decade, a decade now, something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. You're like, um, <laughs> this was just kind of a small thing we were doing uh, for each other which was just like a, a, a fun thing. And it eventually evolved into what you are reading today. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah. yeah, so I think, yeah, it, it, the important part to know about, um, one of the important parts to know about the reasons we kind of teamed up is that Tristan knew me before I came out as non-binary um, and he got to kind of like learn about they them pronouns and adapt his language. Um, and I thought, you know, it was very important when we kind of moved forward with this project to ensure that um, the voice of someone who did have like perhaps a learning curve was part of like helping to teach how it feels and how, how to go through that kind of learning curve. Um, Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to be non-binary. Um, so we can be sort of on the same page. 
again, sometimes I teach this to, or I, I, I do, you know, my talks with, about this book to folks who are brand new to this idea. So if this is redundant, I'm sorry, feel free to zone out for like 30 seconds. Um, people may have noticed that Tristan and, and I didn't really focus a lot on what it means to be non-binary if you've read the book. It's not really like, there isn't like a chapter about like what that identity means. Um, and that's because it can mean like so many things to so many people. It is really hard to come up with a concise and accurate description. Um, so we kind of like didn't, because it was like an, a quick and easy guide, we didn't really like delve into it very much in the book. Um, but basically like non-binary is like this big umbrella term. Um, and then I have some nice written descriptions there for folks who are new to it. Um, it basically uh, non-binary um, at its core is used to describe someone whose gender, uh, whose gender identity doesn't fit into male or female. And it's an umbrella term, meaning that it encompasses um, a lot of other terms and a lot of other identities. So like gender queer or a gender or gender fluid. Um, Tristan, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I'm, I'm just following along with this stuff too. I mean, this is, I think one of the things that we talked about just leading off of what you said in the book mm -hmm. is that we didn't talk about what it means to be non-binary and that was on purpose yeah. because a lot of the people that we were planning on giving this book to didn't, like they didn't need to understand that to use pronouns in the way that is, you know, is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That is such a good point that it was like, I think you're like, it's been so, since it's been like so long since our conception of this book, but you're, it, it was a very conscious decision to be like, this is the book you give after, you know, it's not going to explain your identity. It's going to explain how you want to be. Um, I always talk about respecting pronouns. It's like, it's, 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 it's similar to like uh, respecting someone's boundaries or when someone's like, please use these pronouns for me. They're basically being like, this is how you can like express love and care for me. Um, so that's like, I feel like trying to explain someone's like identity to someone else, like you can't do it, I think in a book, because it's gonna be so personal to, from person to person. Yeah. Here's a page from the book, if you haven't seen it, one of our nifty and quick charts that we have in there. Um, some non-binary people use they them pronouns, um, some don't. Um, in our, in this like kind of conversation that we're having now, Tristan and I aren't going to do like a pronoun 101 kind of conversation. You can kind of take a look at this chart if you need a quick, like, what are we even talking about? <laughs> um, but we aren't like, um, we're like a, like a writer and a cartoonist before we are like experts at kind of like explaining gender identity and, um, pronoun, kind of, even, even pronoun, even though we read like a book about it, we're not quite experts at kind of like being able to like talk and teach it. So we're not doing like a little bit of like one-on-one -on -one stuff. I did want to include a little bit about what it means um, to be non-binary. Um, but yeah, if you want to kind of like go into the details of it, that's what the book is for. And if I remember correctly, we put this chart in right at like at the last minute this was kind of an, an mm -hmm. addition we had focused so much on they them and there are so many other different types of pronouns yeah. people people wanted to use but we didn't really have the space to to really dig into the meat of that so this was our solution was coming up with a, a reference chart that not just showed not was that wasn't just easy to to reference if you needed to know but also showed that there were other other pronouns that people may prefer yep or use Yep. Um, yeah, and this is also kind of a nice point that we are taking questions. So feel free to just write them in the chat. We'll get to them at the end. Um, and since I have done this kind of conversation with like sixth graders who are very bold and don't really, they are not shy about asking questions. 
if you are like kind of confused or you want to know something like a little bit more personal or whatever I am and I think Tristan is too like really open to answering those questions um so we're not doing like a one-on-one talk per se but um if you have questions about identity changes or whatever you can plop it in the chat so how did we make this book um it started as a zine um and it really started because like i said tristan kind of uh, learned to adapt his language and became a really really great ally to mutual friends as well as like strangers um and i was we were both working in the service industry and i was getting misgendered a lot um and then even when i wasn't getting misgendered people came and they had like the same questions over and over and over again um, and I think one night, Tristan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I was just like venting to you about how exhausting it is to have to answer those questions over and over and over again. Um, and you were like, oh, we should make a zine about it. Yeah, I mean, it was, I think we were closing that night. It was just like we were working together. Oh, yeah, we were working together. <laughs> and it really was the next day we went to a coffee shop and wrote the whole zine and there were the zine ended up a bit edgier than the the current book it was it was half venting more than it was about yeah. um <laughs> so there was there was uh there were a lot more swear words in it and there was a lot more alcohol consumption in it um which we we did clean up a little bit for that mm -hmm. for the other one but it was a way of just like of kind of coping with that daily stress that you were going through yeah um but it was, I mean, it was, it was great, you know, and, and we have made zines before this. This wasn't our first one. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what a zine is. Yeah, yeah. So for folks who are new to the concept of zine, it, tech, it means it's short for magazine, but it means a lot more than like a small magazine. Zines are, um, they're usually um, very easy and cheap to reproduce. So they're often photocopied on just like photocopy paper stapled. And um, they are either sold for very little money or traded or frequently just like given away. So we really wanted to make a zine because a zine is a really, um, uh, it's a great tool to kind of disperse information in a way that is accessible and affordable. Um, and that is, and zines have a, a long history of being used in marginalized communities as a way to express and share information to uh, those also within marginalized communities and to outside. Um, so it just kind of like made sense. We didn't have a lot of money for like a fancy printing. And I was like, oh, I can make these for like 25 cents. We'll sell them for two bucks or just like, we just like left them places too. Um, yeah, coffee shops around here, places that yeah. we regularly went. Yep. We gave yeah. them to a lot of people too. Yeah, we just like handed them out. Um, so eventually this zine landed on the desk of our editor, um, Ari Yarwood, who ran, who, who used to run Limerence Press, which is part of ONI. Um, Ari had a phone call about wanting to expand it as a book. Um, and I just, for the visuals, here's the page from the original zine and how it kind of like translates um, into the, the page of the book. Um, and when Ari called me, I was like, okay, I have to get Tristan on because like, if we're going to expand it at that point, it had been, cause I feel like we had, the zine was being printed for ye almost like four or five years before I think the book. I think we made it in 2015, maybe 2014. Yeah. So it had, it had been around for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. And we had printed multiple runs of it, so it. Yep. It, there were quite a lot of copies of it in circulation. Yeah. Um. And when we were kind of just like starting to talk with like Oni Press, I was like, this was like my dream was to get like published at the time. But I wouldn't. I I in the conversations with the editor, I was like, yo, this started as a zine. And it's super important to me that it kind of continues 
um, what zines do as far as being like affordable and accessible. Um, and I was like, I'll only do it if we can keep it under 10 bucks. Um, and I think we were able to land on eight, which is amazing. So um, when Tristan and I were doing this book, like profit wasn't necessarily like yeah. a, <laughs> a thing we were like thinking or, or even like aiming for more than like being able to be like, I want this to be able to be bought by like a kid. I want it to be, you know, bought by. Um, and a, a lot of times. Yeah. The, what we were hoping for did happen a lot of times in that it's it's often purchased and then given away. Mm -hmm. So it, it's mm -hmm. the same person is uh, purchasing multiple copies and giving them away. And so that's why the price point was really important to us going into the, into making the book, was to make sure that that was not going to put additional financial pressure and that people would, wouldn't feel guilty about or, or frustrated that they were going to give something away that cost 15 or $16 more than you know, if it's just eight. Yeah, I never wanted someone to be, to like go back to their friend and be like, remember that book I lent you? Can I get that back? It was like, I wanted it to be a book that's like, I lent you that book. I'm going to snag a new copy. No stress. Yeah. Um, so the original zine, I think it's right there, went from a cheap and easy introduction <laughs> to they, them pronouns to a quick and easy, um, because it, it was still eh, not quite as cheap. Um, printed on like neon paper. And then there was a first cover with a green. Um, it was also about five pages, I think. It was the oh, yeah. <laughs> bare bones. Yeah, it was very like, here's what's going on. We're doing it in a really snarky way. Yeah, we took out all the swear words, all <laughs> the drinking. It's very YA friendly. Well, I think the zine was also really focused specifically on the customers at the restaurant we were working at. Right. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a, good point. a little bit too. Yeah. Um, so we so the zine was like a little bit of images and text, and then when we expanded it to a quick and easy guide, we decided to move forward with like just like a full blown comic. Um, and this was obviously, I am a cartoonist. It's kind of like the medium I work in, um, but it made sense for this topic where um, at the time, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of like having information that is shared um, in multiple formats so people can access it in a way that feels good for them. So some people who are learning about they, them pronouns for the first time, they're gonna wanna read um, a, like a written book about it or a blog post or watch a YouTube video. So it kind of made sense to perhaps like, even though there's been like shorter comics previously about they done pronouns, but it made sense to kind of push it as a comic as like, here's just like one more way to access this information. Um, I think it was also a lot more approachable as a comic. Like mm -hmm. I said before, this is not, we're, this is not a book on theory. This is, there is no like, this is not advanced, super advanced, advanced stuff. Um, but I think the fact that it is a comic makes it more approachable in that regard, like almost in like a sneaky way. Yeah. Um, and I like that you can read the whole thing in, you know, five minutes. So if it's in a waiting room, if it's, if it's somewhere, it's able to be consumed really quickly. Um, yeah. And, you know, in our experience with the zine and with the, with the comic, we saw it as oh, that people were going to be giving it to people that either didn't know or maybe didn't even want to know this information. Yeah. So that yeah. having a quick, easily digestible, um, funny was important to us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things that has contributed to, to the, the success and we're still really, really proud of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Approachable, casual, and like fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Here's us as cartoon characters. Uh, we still look like this today. Very impressed. <laughs> um, I kind of want to talk about um, striking a balance, like how we kind of approached a balance between like cis confusion and being unapologetic about pronouns. Um, a little bit 
this is the topic. Um, I don't think when we wrote it, um, at the time that we wrote it, I had many years of using they, them pronouns. Um, and I had kind of figured out this balance in my own life as far as um, being misgendered and when, and I, you know, I think I also, over time in the service industry, grew kind of like a tough skin about it. And like, when am I gonna be offended? When am I gonna let it slide? Um, and um, who am I gonna like educate and who am I gonna just like, kind of like back away from? Um, and it was important to kind of like figure out a way to put that balance into the book. Tristan, do you have anything to say about that kind of topic? I mean, I think that like, I really let you lead on this when we were writing, um, cause I think you had a lot more complex feelings about it. But I think the thing that as an, as an ally is you wanted, this is like the, the most important thing for you is like, you don't want to offend people. You want to make sure that the person is, is, is comfortable and you don't know necessarily like how to ask the right questions. It's like it's all on a lot of new ground. Mm -hmm. And I think we try to cover that in the book that like, you will make mistakes and that's fine. And that like, you know, it's about intent and that's the best way to, you know, to learn is, is the, is the intent. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, I, I think I tried really hard um, to be like, to express how important as someone who uses they, them pronouns um, to express how important patience can be for folks who are learning a totally new concept that they're, they, it might take them years to kind of like fully, fully grasp or fully get the hang of um, in their language, but also to like respect boundaries and have, and put boundaries too up for um, the folks that love you. And here's some sample pages um, from the beginning. Um, Tristan, how do you think we went just like going back, how do you think we went about balancing entertainment and um, inform being informative? Because that was definitely, I think, something that we had to like really kind of think about in our mm -hmm. second, like the zine. It was like we were just like throw it on the throw it in there. Yeah. But I feel like with this book, we had a lot more um, intention. <laughs> yeah, I think we definitely started with the intention, and then yeah. the, the jokes just came. But you know, it's really important that like it can be a I think that like pronouns can be a, 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 a serious issue for a lot of people. And so we didn't want to make light of the situation. And yeah. so it's like, make, you know, you don't, I think going like putting yourself out there and learning something new and like being uncomfortable is, is really hard. Um, especially as we get older. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I, we never wanted to make fun of people for accidentally saying the wrong thing or misgendering someone. Yeah. You know, the, the butt of the jokes were, was when it was done with intention. Yep. Um, and that was an important distinction for us. Yeah. And, and is in, in life, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things we really try to get across in the book. Yeah. And I think like also when we were thinking about like the humor in the book, um, I wanted to make sure that again, like different access points of information, this is a book for folks who want to kind of like read about, read about pronouns and they them, using they them pronouns in a way that does have that is a little bit lighter um, and doesn't, it was important that I didn't read like a pamphlet, not that there's anything wrong with pamphlets of information, um, but I definitely wanted it to also reflect me and Tristan's like personality. Uh, also drawing this book was done so fast between <laughs> when the script was done and when the pages were due which is on me for not kind of like negotiating a deadline, like a further away deadline. Um, but I had, we had to make sure it was like entertaining for us as well, like as creators, you know, like I wanted to make sure we were like cracking ourselves up if possible. I, I think that like the, the thing that stands out to me uh, when I knew, when I really felt that we had strike that or struck that balance was, I gave this to my grandfather who was a, um, are you still at, well, not anymore, he's retired. Uh, he's a Marine, uh, Marine Corps drill sergeant, um, very right wing. And I, I gave this to him and he read the whole thing in one sitting. 
And he, at the time, was working as a greeter at Walmart. And he said, you know, he was like, oh, this is, you know, I'm really glad you made this. This is, this is, I, you know, I, you're, it's great, but I'm going to change my language when I greet people every time they come into Walmart. And I was like, man, if I can get an 87 year old ex Marine drill sergeant to <laughs> sign up with us, even just, he, he doesn't have to like, he, I don't need him to agree with it. I don't need him to believe in any of it, but if he's changing his language in his job, then that's victory. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is so awesome. Love that. Here's some more sample pages from um, the book where you can see we replace drinking with candy on that page. <laughs> I don't know if there's kids here. I know it's a little library event, it's all ages, so I won't go into it that much. Um, but one thing, oh, one thing that um, Tristan and I get asked every, like I get asked every time I talk about this book um, is if we could have an expanded version, what would we add? Um, because it's a quick and easy guide and I wanted to make sure that it, me and my editor wanted to make sure it was very like actually a quick read as Tristan mentioned, like people can read it like in the waiting room of an office, you know, it was kind of like our goal there were definitely like things that we left out. Um, and I think if I could have an expanded version, um, I would have talked about how non-binary um, identities and using they, them pronouns, um, how it kind of like can intersect with um, race and class and body size. So I think those perspectives, I, as a white person, I can't give them, but I would have loved space to like have like a guest artist or, you know, like something like that. So, some, so those perspectives and those voices could be heard, which I do recognize are lacking in the book. Yeah. Tristan, do you have anything that you would have added? I don't know if I would have added it to the book, but I think the thing that I think about a lot, especially since we made this in 2014, is that like pronouns are are important, um, but you don't want to get, I don't want people to get stuck into, in that like language is the only issue um, in your friends' lives. Like, like language isn't the key to allyship. You know, it, it's helpful. Like knowing, knowing the pronouns is, is definitely a great, step but like i always think of like maslow's hierarchy of needs where like basic needs are more important than psychological needs and they then pronouns is, is in the psychological need but if you know if your landlord is evicting you because you're trans then whether your coworkers use pronoun the right pronouns isn't quite the most important thing to you so it's like you know part of being an ally is using pronouns but part of it is also standing up for people and you know, doing the work outside of just saying, you know, I just want people to think that like the magic, you'll say the magic words and then that will fix everything. Mm -hmm. That's just not how it works. And part of what we wanted to do in the book is make it seem like, oh, here's a great first step. But I would have, I think I would have added more of that near the end. Yeah, that would have been really awesome. So being an ally is also about advocating and supporting people in other ways. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, here's Tristan. <laughs> I think I forgot I put this slide in, so sorry. <laughs> but uh, great, great point. I also always want to add, um, or like kind of like end when um, I'm talking about being like a non-binary creator, non-binary cartoonist to talk about how many other um, non-binary cartoonists are out there working. Um, so here's just like a few samplings. Um, feel free to like drop names in the chat, especially if you think that maybe it's someone who's like less on the radar because I like to always know who else is kind of like out there drawing comics, um, making stuff. And um, I think now we're gonna move on to questions. Tristan, do you have anything else to add? I kind of skipped 
No, I think we can move on to questions. Great. I'm going to stop the sharing then. Great. All right. Thank you very much. If it were in person, we'd be all clapping <laughs> and hanging out right now. Um, thank you. It was delightful. Um, I like how I didn't know you all met at work, so that was nice to learn. I feel like uh, a lot of people have had that experience, camaraderie after work, talking mm -hmm. about uh, how that is. So if people have questions, a few people have submitted questions, feel free to keep putting them in the chat as we get started. Um, so I guess a good first one to start with is, um, how can you be a good ally to non-binary and trans people while at work? So I think this is actually a really interesting and an important question. And that's gonna depend on a lot of things, but it's gonna depend on your, on your work environment. Um, if you were in a position where you can actually make rules and change things, then like that's, that's great, you know, and, and you should talk to the non-binary people at your office, or if there aren't any non-binary people, then you can still make those changes. Even things as small as talking to your payroll company and switching the, taking a, the gendered language off of paychecks. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to talk to anyone about that. You just get it done. Um, but I think one of the things that's, that's more difficult and, and I think more important is when you work somewhere where your workplace is more hostile to it, um, which is something that I have done a lot of thinking about myself. Like how, you know, how can you be an ally in those situations, not just directly to the non-binary people you work with, but kind of covering for them a little bit and I think that like one of the things that I've been trying to do is what I've been calling the being the stick in the mud of like when you hear someone you know whether it's your boss or coworker say something um that is not great um that you correct them and that you get a reputation in the office or the workplace as the person who who calls people on stuff and makes other people uncomfortable and what you're doing then is you're creating a space where people that have, you know, unfortunate views or, or bigoted views don't feel safe talking about it. You're not, you're not necessarily changing their mind, but what you're doing is you're just generating an aura of uncomfortability uh, to kind of give cover to people that, that, that your boss or whoever knows that like, they, they're gonna get called out on something if they say something publicly. And I think that like that's, that's a pretty hard step. I, I think that like naturally you want to avoid conflict and especially with the superior and you're putting yourself out there, you know, making them not like you as much. But I think that's one of the best ways that you can cover for your coworkers or make at least make that space a little better for them. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add because I think Tristan, I think that was like such like very well said is just like, be that stick in the mud, just like if you, you know. Um, and I think the only thing I would add to that is start, even if there isn't like a non-binary trans queer person in your office um, that you know of, just kind of like start today being that person. You don't have to wait until someone's uncomfortable to do it. Great, thanks very much. Um, so the next question is, um, Oh, I'm just going to read verbatim. So if I know a person's name is Carol and that they're non-binary, it seems like if I just always use the name Carol, then I wouldn't have to worry about making a mistake with any of their pronouns or any of the other pronouns, including their preferred pronouns, right? Or would I be perceived as rude if I didn't use them there? I can't speak for hypothetical Carol. But I can speak for me that I feel like that is like a great way to kind of like catch yourself um, from like misgendering. It's like, oh, I'm just going to use someone's name, like their name. Um, and I think that with if, if you're worried about misgendering and it's like new language, if you are ever like talking about Carol to friends or something like that, um, practice using they them pronouns with, with them like when they're not in the room and then see if that kind of slow, if your language will kind of like adapt when Carol is in the space. That's my, is in the space. That's my kind of like take on it. Is like, I think it's okay to play it safe um, until perhaps outside of that space, your language has adapted. 
and I think going off what Archie's saying is that if you're using that language when Carol's not around, you're practicing. You know, that's that's what the and then you know if you start to feel more comfortable with it, you can use it more when Carol is around. And you can use a few. I don't think it's rude to use someone's full proper name, um, but I think that you're going to be in your head a lot about it, thinking about it, and at that point, you might as well just try and practice the the they them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that like, I mean, once again, we, we don't know Carol, we can't, we can't speak for Carol, but if it's something you're, you're worried about and, and Carol is amenable, talk to them and see like, would, I'm, I'm learning this. Would you prefer if I only used your full name in case I get it, in case I get it wrong? Or are you okay if I'm doing my, my practice with you when you're here? Mm -hmm. it, it really is about communication um, and letting them know that you know, you're trying and, and you have the best intentions here. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, hi, I love grease bats and queer flagging. My question is, how do you find a queer community outside of large cities? I live in a finance bro heavy area and find that I have to more aggressively, I have to be more aggressively queer flag with my appearance, which is not necessarily what I always want to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, that is tough. So just like acknowledging that is not easy. Um, so I would suggest um, if you're outside of a large city to try and find a queer book club or start a queer book club. Um, if that feels like something that you can do like safely in your town. Um, a lot of bookstores, not all, but a lot of bookstores are very radical spaces. Um, and I have made, I mean, I'm in Minneapolis now, so I am in a city and I have, so take that for, for what it's worth, but I have made the majority of my LGBTQ friends here through book clubs, because it gives you something to talk about. Um, and I think it, uh, having a book club, like it attracts people who are looking for other queer folks to kind of like hang out with. So that is like my one um kind of like solid suggestion um and it doesn't necessarily like you can come looking however feels comfortable for you and then you're not also like trying to be like are they queer are they not queer i'm trying to like judge um so that's like one idea i think any sort of like not any but some volunteering and mutual aid work is also a great way to meet queer people in my experience in Minneapolis too. Yeah. And if anyone has any other suggestions, pop them in the chat. We got one uh, recommendation for board game groups and um, um, PG, RPG role, role playing groups um, are another great way to meet queer folks in that person's experience. And like, I, I obviously don't have the same experience, but I think that one of the the positives of the pandemic is so many things are online now that you might be able to explore communities that you might not have had access to in the same way. If we're talking about book clubs or any sort of, you know, some, everything's on, I mean, we're on Zoom right now. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, great. So um, here's a nice question. Um, you say you've discussed this topic with a lot of different folks. Do you have any tips for discussing pronouns and non-binary identities with older folks, especially older folks who think of themselves as allies but don't understand non-binary identities and push back against it? Um, Tristan, you talked a little about your grandfather, so, but a little more about that, maybe. I mean, I would say I would act surprisingly had, had well, not my, grand, my grandmother uh, was very liberal, opposite of, of my grandfather. And I had much more trouble with her because she was an English teacher. And so she was very set in her ways of what was, what was correct English. And so we would fight about it quite a bit. And she wanted to help, but that was a, that was a really tough hurdle for her. Um, and I think that I mean, I think Archie can speak to this a little bit better than I can of like, you have to pick your battles. Um, and that was one that like, I just never, I never could win with her. 
And, you know, I, I think that like her heart was in the right place and she was not misgendering anyone. She was in oxygen in her home, you know, 99% of the time. So it wasn't like she was actively causing harm or, 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 or voting a certain way. So I think that it, it's difficult. I wish there was a, there was a simple answer, but I mean, it depends on, on who you're talking to. If you're talking to your boss or someone that's a coworker or in a position of power, I, one thing that I've used is if someone is not interested in like LGBTQ or like doesn't think that that's important or right or like correct. Um, I always would tell people in, in that situation that like, oh, well, you're opening yourself up to lawsuits. You know, you, any, any trick you can use to be like, oh, okay, you should change your language because you're going to be vulnerable if this happens as, as like a, in, in a business setting. Um, but I don't think that there's, there's not an easy way to do it. Yeah. Um, I love the business setting tip. <laughs> it would not have occurred to me. Um, I think if it's, I think one thing is to kind of like re remind folks like how language adapts. Um, I think, I don't know if it made it into the book um, and maybe it was just in the zine. I can't remember. Um, how like the word blog didn't exist like when we were growing up and now everyone, it's like universal. Um, and like language is like so adaptable and it changes to kind of like really push that home. And if it is something that you have like a personal relationship with at the end, it's like, okay, you know what? You might not actually ever grasp this idea, but what you need to know is how I want to be loved by you and how I want like you using my pronouns is an act of care. Um, and really like spelling it out that like it hurts when you don't do this. Uh, and that also I mean, like doesn't always work. Um, but a lot of the times like we're always just like so thirsty for like connection that it's like, oh, I don't want to lose you in my life. I will try to like to do this because I respect you. So kind of like bringing it back to those points could be an idea. Thanks for all those uh, tips. I think people will find them really helpful. Um, other question we have is, how do you feel about people saying preferred pronouns, indicating it is an optional preference, which we know it is obviously not? Yeah, it is um, an outdated way of talking about pronouns. I think that it kind of like got put into language um, when they then pronouns just kind of like started popping up in media a lot um and people were kind of like trying to like bring this into perhaps like work environments or like you know within friend groups um it is updated is it, if folks can kind of be like okay this is their pronouns awesome however language is so adaptable i am not offended when this is me personally i'm not offended when someone's like my preferred pronouns are or like you, your preferred, I don't, it doesn't bother me. The intent is there. The intent is good. Um, I think it will disappear with time. I, I said it just earlier in this. Oh, when yeah. <laughs> I, like, I, I caught myself, like, I, I said it and I heard it and I was like, that's not, I didn't, all right. And, you know, and I, I just moved on. And so I think that's one of the, you know, that's one of the important things is that, like, because I learned that as what was the right thing to say when I first started learning about this. And now it's changed. So I'm, I'm still updating my, my lexicon and how, how I speak. And so that's, I think that's important is to, to give yourself grace and, and to know that like, it's a process. Um, if you're not doing it with ill intent, then you just apologize and move on or just move on quickly and hope no one notices. And it doesn't yeah. come up later in front of an entire group of people. <laughs> All right, and we have, uh, I'm gonna end with um, one last question before we um, close out today. Um, when is it important to apologize for misgendering? Is there a time or experience when it's not? I think it's, when is it important to apologize? Is that what the yeah. question is? Of when is it important to apologize for misgendering? Every time, I think it's important to note that you, uh, that you, 
you bipped it and to acknowledge that you saw the mistake. Um, I also like, I don't know, no one's perfect. I also have misgendered like the people I'm close to just like randomly, who knows why. Um, and it's just like, I think a quick, I'm sorry, correct yourself like verbally and then move on. Cause no one really want, you don't have to like go through like a whole, I don't know. You don't have to like spiral. I, I don't want to be around while someone who misgenders me spirals <laughs> into like a guilt trip. And then I, and then I have to be like, no, no, it's okay. I don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. Just like apologize and you can move on. Um, apologize, correct it. And then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I, I mean, I don't, I can't say I'm not, I have rarely misgendered, but whenever I've been, especially if I'm in like a work situation and I'll, I'll mess up and I'll say the wrong one. Sometimes I'll be like, I'll just be like, Oh, nope, I meant this. And then it'll move on. Like if the, uh, if the, uh, if I've apologized before, I think sometimes the, it doesn't have to happen like every single time. If you know, if it's established that you are learning. Yeah. But once again, it's going to depend on the person. And I think that, you know, intent is super important and to not get so hung up on on apologizing for every single mistake yeah great well thank you very much um for your wisdom and thank you everyone for such um in-depth helpful questions um so before we part i'd like to share some contact information and just a few other lgbt events and programs that we have at the library um, so if you have any interest in the programs or there's particular things that you'd like to see at the library, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm going to put my info in the chat in a moment. Um, sorry, I'm not a multitasker. All right, there we go. Great. Um, so just a few things throughout the month of June on the third floor of the library, we'll be hosting an art exhibition of typography entitled Trans Joy by the Evanstonian artist Jasper Huber. His exhibition discusses trans masculinity and overcoming trans stereotypes. He will be hosting an artist workshop on the 23rd from six to seven called Queer Art Show and Tell. So people can come and share their art. It's gonna start with a little mini um, presentation. The every, uh, every fourth Friday of the month, um, all year round, uh, the library works with the Trans Masculine Alliance of Chicago for a book club where um, trans people read trans authors. And this month we will be having a choose your own adventure trans poetry so people can bring a poem that they like and share it with the group. And then starting next month, there will be a new book club. All these great book clubs, ways to meet queer people, um, you know, as we discussed before. So our colleagues Kelly Fleming and Katie Jacobs will be coordinating a monthly LGBT book and film club. So in July, we'll be discussing the film Rafiki and all are welcome. So you don't have to identify a certain way to come to this book club. And then finally, the Evanston Public Library and Northwestern's Rainbow Alliance are working together to create affinity group spaces specifically for LGBT, BIPOC, people of color, and transgender non-conforming communities in Evanston to meet regularly throughout the year. So stay tuned to hear more about these efforts. Um, and so thank you again for our authors for sharing their experience with us and to everyone for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Thanks everyone. <laughs>